this is our third lecture. This is um, going to be on the subject of exponential growth and decay. We'll give you first an example of growth. Um, holding a sheet of paper here. Actually, this was done on Mythbusters once. I don't know if folks have seen that episode or even that show. It's a little bit old now. But um, I'm using a tool called a dial caliper to measure how thick the paper is. And I don't expect you to be able to read it through the, the screen, but it's three thousandths of an inch. Not very thick. Um, it's close, close to the same dimension as a human hair. You know, really, paper's not thick stuff. Uh, but the process we're going to go through puts it through a, a sort of an exponential growth thing, and, and we end up with something that gets quite thick. So here's the idea. Um, the, the main question is, how many times can you fold a sheet of paper in half? I'm not gonna, how thick is this now? Since it was three thousandths of an inch thick for one sheet, now that I've folded it over, it's a double sheet, so that would be six thousandths of an inch. I'm gonna, I'm thinking we ought to keep track of that. Hold on a sec. Let's do this. All right, so we had uh, when it was a single fold, or what? Actually, I guess when it was in zero folds, we had 0 0.003. Uh, after one fold, it's double that, 0 0.006. Okay. Um, this is exciting. I'll fold it a third, a second time. Try to do it fairly accurately. Now, if you think about it, there's four thicknesses of paper there, right? So four times three is twelve. That means after two folds, we're at point oh 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 one two zero one two yeah. twelve thousandths of an inch. Now I forget what fold we are on three. There's my third fold. After three folds, mm, that's um. I'll double this. Doubling twelve is twenty-four. So one two. And then after four folds, it's going to be 0.048. Sort of seem like small numbers, right? 0.048 is um, a little less than a sixteenth of an inch. I and mean, I, I could set these calipers to that dimension, but you would barely be able to see the gap that's formed. Well, where do I hold it to so you can see it? Yeah. That's not much in there. You know? uh, a little more than... A little more than the thickness of a fingernail. And that was only four folds. And the point is that every time we do this, the thickness of the total thing doubles. So after five folds, we're at 0.096. I didn't do five yet. I think this is five. How many total do you think I can do? I believe the, the record is eight. But I'm at five now, and it's already becoming difficult to fold it over and make the crease. There's six. I think I can get seven with this sheet of paper. But, you know, this thing is not, not thin anymore. It's about a quarter of an inch thick. It's, it's, uh, it's fat enough that I really, and I don't have enough area to grip to put a bend in it. It's not going to happen. I mean, you know, it's, it's a wad, and I've got a, uh, no, no place to get any leverage to actually make it to bend. So how thick was it there? I was at uh, six. I was at the seventh fold. Oh, nice. Hmm. Can I do that one in my head? Point one nine two. And then the double of that. Wow, that's big. It's almost point four. Why can't I seem to do this in my brain? Okay, let's turn to a computer for help. I'm going to go to the uh, view where we've got the GeoGebra in it. And um, what I'm going to do instead of, I'm not actually going to use the graphing part of this thing, but just, um, just get it to calculate for me. What we did was we started with 0 0.003, and we times it by 2, and we times it by 2, and we times it by, we kept timesing it by 2 over and over again. So here's 0 0.003. How many times did I times by two? Well, it was seven times. Now, I could write two times, two times, two times, 
Mm. Actually, it's keeping track for me, isn't it? Two. That's how many seven? How many twos have I got there? That's only five. Times six, and here's the seventh one. Three, four, eight. Three, eight, four. Sorry. Um, of course, that was a silly way to, to do it, though. Wouldn't it have been better to say, I'm going to multiply 0 0.003 times a power of 2. In fact, it's uh, raised to the 7th power. Get to that 0.384 right away. All right, then, let's, uh, let's switch back to this other view uh, that we had the table on. And take a look at that and see if we can figure out how we might have recognized that the, the sort of growth that's happening here is the bad kind because well a, exponential growth is this term that people throw around and generally misuse um, it doesn't just mean growing rapidly we, we should come up with another word that means growing you know a lot but the character of exponential growth is such that it surprises people. It's it's like what, what happened here, three thousandths of an inch. It's tiny. Six thousandths of an inch. It's still tiny. These are all tiny numbers. And then suddenly, whoa, it's huge. It's as thick as a pencil and you can't fold it anymore, you know? That's the that's the problem with exponential growth. It has this surprise factor. But if you know what to look for, there isn't a surprise. Uh this this pattern that we saw or that we created is is actually really obvious and something that you can see in all kinds of data. Um, what you do if you want to recognize exponential growth is look at how it was changing. And don't think about how it was changing as in were we adding something, right? Right here I was adding three thousandths of an inch, but here I was adding nine thousandths, so that's no good, right? I want to figure out what we're doing to go from one position to the other and if you think about the physical process, what it was, was we multiplied by 2. 3 times by 2, and then we times by 2 again, and so on, right? We kept always timesing by 2. How do you locate uh, what that factor was? What you actually do is take two adjacent things and form their quotient or their ratio. Uh, take 0 0.096 and divide it by 0 0.048, the latter one divided by the earlier one, and you get two. So that's called a common ratio. And what this and all exponential growth patterns have in common, no pun intended, is, is they have a common ratio. Uh, so let me let me contrast this for a second with linear growth. Um, in fact, I'm going to give you a, a, a comparison kind of in a parallel way between a linear function and an exponential function um, with the same numbers. So in a linear function, we, we have a starting point. Let's call it B. That's actually what we always call it. And then we have a, an increment. How much do you add each time you, you move x1 up? Uh, let's call that m. Because if you think about going over one unit, x going over one, you're going to go up by m. That's the slope. So I really mean these to be the m and b. In a linear uh, situation, that's how things behave. Now, in an exponential situation, it's really similar. We start somewhere. And in the case of exponentials, usually people call that A. All right. And here's going to be a little bit of a problem, because there's a name for the, the, um, the way we increment, and that is also B. <laughs> so the B on this side and the B on this side actually represent different things. Uh, but anyway, that I, it's not quite right to call it an increment. It, it is a descriptor for how we change. It's, it's a factor. It's a multiplying factor. So on the linear side, when you when you have a starting point of B and an increment of M, 
you get a formula that looks like this, B plus, we're adding M a bunch of times, X times in general, and that gives you MX. I know we usually write that the other way around. But uh, in the exponential case, what we've got is we start at A, and then we multiply by B some number of times, and that's raising B to the power. So look, these two things are really, really similar. It's just that um, each operation has gone up one notch as you go from here to here. We had plus turning into times, and we had times turning into, I'm going to use an up caret to represent powers. Okay. That's what's going on. We were multiplying, I'm oh, sorry, we were adding B, here we're multiplying by A. We we're multiplying X by M, on this side we're, we're raising B to the X power. But it really is the same kind of thing, except with the operations changed. We, we start somewhere, and we over and over do something. In this case, we're adding M over and over. In this case, we're multiplying by B over and over. The results are phenomenally different, though. Let's, let me do a, an example of this. Uh, we'll compare using the same numbers. I, I'm not A's and B's anymore, but I'm actually going to stick numbers in here. Uh, 2x plus 3 would be one function. That's a linear thing. If you notice the M is 2 and the B is 3 versus 3 times 2 raised to the x power. And let's uh, let's turn this into a table, and we'll have a, a column for x as well. Um, one thing that's kind of nice in both cases, when x is 0, it's really easy to figure out what's going on. Because uh, when x is 0, well, the things with x in them kind of simplify. 2 times 0 is 0, so this becomes just a 3. Whereas this one, little tougher actually you have to know what 2 to a 0 power is but I think everybody remembers that rule anything to the 0 power gives you 1 so this is also just 3 in other words they have the same starting value when x is 0 they both give you the same result when when we go from 0 to 1 this guy gets incremented by 2 and you can you can just add 2 or you can say well uh, we could use the formula. Right? 2 times 1 would give us 2, plus 3 is 5. You see how that means we've just added 2 on there? On this one, if you let x be 1, 2 to 1 is just 2, and 3 times 2 is 6. Not a huge difference, really, between the two of them. We start at 3, this one goes to 5, this one goes to 6. Big look, it's only one unit higher. The surprise factor comes after we do a few more iterations. If I go to x equals 2, this guy bumps up to 7. But this guy, what were we doing to go from 1 to the next in this? We're multiplying by 2. So this guy goes to 12. They were tied up in the beginning. This was 1 ahead there, but suddenly he's 5 ahead. It's almost double the, the, the other side right there. And it gets worse. When you get to 3, the linear thing grows up to 9. The exponential thing grows to 24. At 4, 9 and 2 more is 11. Okay, not a big deal there, but here it doubles, so you get 48. You know, it's almost five times as large at that point. So if you imagine you didn't have the formulas and, and you just had this, these, these data, what you do looking at this one is look at how do they change from one value to the next, and you'll see that the common behavior is that you add to add to every time. And so we say there's a common difference in these on that, in that column, and it's 2. On this side, though, every time we go from 1 to the next, what we're doing is timesing by 2. And that means what we have on the in this column, there's a common ratio. And that's also 2. But, you know, multiplying by 2 has a much bigger effect than adding 2 does.
All right, let's let's pull that same thing, but in reverse. What I'm going to do is is show you some functions, and we'll identify them as either being linear or exponential, and then we'll actually figure out what the formulas for these things are. So the first one, I guess I can give you x and f of x. Well, I'm, I'm going to need two of these, so I might as well spell them both out. x and the other one will be g of x. Okay, the um, the x values are just going to go zero, one, two, three. That's it. Only because I'm I'm just copying down what I wrote in my notes here. I made these up in advance, so we can get an example of how all this plays out. All right, so the the first one goes like this: two, six, eighteen, fifty-four. The second one goes seven. 10, 13, 16. Now, in one of these, uh, there, there's one of each type here. So in one of them, you have a common ratio, and the other, you have a common difference. Well, can you spot which, which one is which? Basically, you can try both things and see what happens, right? Um, 6 minus 2 gets us a 4 there. 18 minus 6 gets us a 12 there. Uh-oh, okay, it's not good. How about if we divide? 6 divided by 2 is 3. 18 divided by 6 is also 3. 54 divided by 18. Well, you might not spot that one, but that's 3 too. Right? So here what we've got is a common ratio of 3. That will show up in the formula. In fact, the formula is really easy to write down now. The, the, the common ratio that you found is the base of the exponential expression, or 3 to the x power. Um, if it was just 3 to the x power, then when x was 0, we would get 1. But we've actually got 2. So here, I've just fixed that. It's 2 times 3 to the x. The, the first number you see right there, that'll be, comes up out front. And this common ratio, that's what will show up right there. Well, let's do the, the other one. It's kind of a letdown now because we I, I told you there's two. Uh, there's one of each, right? So that, that this other one is must be the linear one. Um, 10 over 7 is not the same thing as 13 over 10. You, you can check out those ratios are not the same. But if you look additively to go from 7 to 10, you're adding 3. You go from 10 to 13, you're adding 3. These, these are... Instead of times, you can buy something, we're adding something. And we started at 7. If you if you start at 7, then the, the b in your mx plus b is going to be 7. When, if that's what's associated with x equals 0, that's, that's the b. Um, and then this common uh, difference that we see of 3, that's the m. So this, this guy's formula, uh, okay, I guess I should write it all out, common difference, I'm going to abbreviate that, is 3, and the formula ends up being 7 plus 3 times x. Which is, you know, both of these are easy enough to check if somewhere along the line, just to, if you didn't believe in that. Can you check easily enough? Okay. When you have an exponential expression or an exponential function, there's basically three ways you may see the formula written down. The, um, the first one we've already looked at. It's something times something else raised to the x power. So a and b are constant. But that's, that's almost, in a way, that's the definition of what it means to be exponential. There's some number b so that you look for the powers of that thing, uh, maybe scaled by an a. Another form that you'll see, especially in finance, is this, a times 1 plus r to the x. Now, that is a formula that emphasizes the, the idea of interest rate um, or, or percent change, is maybe another way to think of it. If I, if I tell you that we're currently in, in an inflationary period, it's probably not news to you. Um, inflation is operating at about 7% per year. 
And what that does, it's, it's a weird phenomenon, because I mean, it's honestly hard for people to think about because it's so weird. Something that we're used to thinking of as sort of a rock-solid entity that doesn't change over time, the U.S. dollar, does change over time. In fact, what happens is money becomes less valuable when you're in an inflationary period. So that's a case where the R here would be a negative number. At 7% uh, inflation, that means this thing here is actually 1 minus 0 0.07, which is 0.93. And you should see what happens when you, when you have a certain amount of money to start with and you multiply it by 0.93 year after year after year. It gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So after after one year, your $10 bill is only worth about $9.30. After two years, it's less than nine, you know, eight and a half, something like that. And it becomes less and less valuable. It's capable of buying less and less stuff, which um, is a pretty strange phenomenon. Don't, um, don't, I personally think you don't need to get too worried about that phenomenon right now because we're, uh, we're showing signs of popping out of the uh, inflationary spiral. Um, in particular, oil prices drive a lot of these issues and, and they seem to be improving. So that's something to look forward to. Uh, there is another growth that almost comes out of left field. And so I need to show you that one. It still has an A out front, but it has this new thing called E, and it's raised to a constant times X. So uh, what is E? E is a particular number that's known as Euler's constant. I know that looks like it should be pronounced Euler, but it really is not. It's Euler, like the Texas Euler's. Uh, Euler's constant is a very unusual number. It is about 2.7. I know it to several decimal places. It's got this strange little foible in it that it, uh, after the 2.7, it repeats 1828 and then another 1828. But after that, it goes haywire. There's all kinds of, it's just random looking digits after that. It's like pi. If you've ever looked at uh, the digits of pi, it's no discernible pattern in them, really. This is just a fluke that it has that 1828 repeating. It's a, it's a what's known as an irrational number. Uh, K is some constant, and I'm, we're going to see that how to how to tie these things together. One thing to notice is that if you have a times e to the k, and then you raise that to the x, just thinking about how exponents work. Um, if you have a power raised to another power, then you just multiply in the powers, in the exponents. So this is a times e to the kx, which tells you that just comparing the forms, b has to be e to the k. Why would I do this business? Why would we have e rather than just figuring out whatever, whatever b is? Well, it turns out for a lot of things, having a standard base for exponentials is a great idea. Uh, although it's maybe a little confusing why we pick something like such a strange number as the base. So for that, I'm, I want to turn to uh, the GeoGebra window again. And that's not so bad. Um, all right. We should just clear out this other stuff. Now, so um, okay, that's pretty odd. I cleared everything and then it kept it. <laughs> kept one of the things. <laughs> I don't know about that. Um, so what I want to do for you is put in an exponential function. Y equals you get a, a variable for the base e. To here and we'll have that variable raised to the x power. Okay. okay, so it created a slider for me. And the slider's default value is at one. 
So what we've got here is the exponential function when b is 1. That's kind of a crazy thing to do. It, it just happens to be the default value for this letter is 1. But why would we think about multiplying by 1 over and over and over again? As an exponential function, that's a dumb one. But if, if the b were, say, 2, you get a, well, I hope that's a clear uptrend in the graph, right? You see that the, it's hard to, I'd like to be able to point without moving the graph here, but I, I can't really do that. Anyway, the, the, the graph starts at like 1, then soon it's at 2, then after that it's at 4. You know, its, it's uh, value is, is on an upward slope. <laughs> the, um, why, why is E such an interesting number? Um, I should just play with this slider a little bit. Let's, let's take E up to big numbers, like the biggest it goes on 5 on that side. See how the curve becomes really steep when you do that? Whereas if I bring B down to 1.4, it grows, but it's not, not as extreme. We started when B was 1, but what if B is smaller than 1? That is when you get into K get into decay. That's like the inflation situation where we're multiplying by 0.97. But this would be inflation at a 20% rate per annum. Um, there's been times where inflation was many percents. <laughs> like, uh, in, in wartime in Germany in World War II, this, there's stories of people bringing wheelbarrows full of money to buy groceries because that, that the money had become so valueless. Civil War in the U.S. was similar. The, the, the Confederate currency became, you know, basically scrap paper uh, because of inflation. I don't think we're we're heading in that direction, but but that would be with inflation rates that are, you know, way in advance of what we're talking about right now. Okay, so where was I? Oh yeah, I'm trying to explain to you why we would have e as this strange value. And what I'm going to do here first is put on a different graph that is got something in common with this exponential. It's got the same starting point, but it's going to be linear. So it's going to be y equals um, 1 plus x. Now that, that graph, oops, sorry, let me kill this and get my space bar. That's sort of a, I don't know, it's a very standard graph, right? It's got, it's got a nice feature. Its value is 1 at, at the origin, but also the way it's sloped is 1 at the origin. Um, later we'll, we'll learn to say that's it's got the same derivative as its own value. Um, and so what we're going to do is try to adjust v so that it has that property too, that it's not only value is 1, that's not going to be a problem. The exponential thing's always going to be 1 because it, it didn't have an a out front. It's just b to the x. But what what value do I need to move this slider to to get it to sort of be parallel to that, um, that blue line? Whoops. Well, 3.1 is too much. I know where it is, <laughs> and I can't get the slider to move to it. It's about 2.7, you know. If we tried to get it really precise, we could we could zoom in there tighter and tighter and say, oh, no, it's still a little slight, slanted and, and move that thing. I, I'm going to ask you to just trust me on this. The reason that we have this weird number, 2.71828, is because if you use that as the base for an exponential, its slope as it passes through the y-axis is exactly the same thing as its value as it passes through the y-axis. Both of them have, are, are, their value is 1. Um, that number e, by the way, you can actually, it's on the keyboard here in, in GeoGebra. It's uh, just, well, see on the right-hand side of the, the left-hand block, there's pi and then there's e. And there, you know, you can verify my memory of the digits of it. 2.718281828 and then 459, and trust me, it goes haywire after that. Okay, so um, we'll end this with a, a quick look at converting between these forms. Oh, 
so I've got to change the change back to this window so we can see what I'm writing. Um, suppose we have that that financial sort of uh, version of things where you've got a one plus R in it. Um, suppose we have an account that is growing at a rate of 3%. We, um, if you want to use the right terminology, you should say 3% per annum, which means each year, if you, if you go back. Um, just an interesting side note, if if inflation is 7% and you've got an account that's growing at 3%, you're actually losing 4% each year. But that's that's, that's part of the, 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 the weirdness of this phenomenon. When you're in an inflationary period, money is no longer the stable thing that you think of it. So you have to imagine you're really shifting grounds. Anyway, uh, let, and it, let's say that it starts with... I don't know, $1,000. Okay. Uh, I, I, uh, we're in the form, uh, the middle group that I, I did, where you have the initial amount is 1000 and you've got a 1 plus R in here, and a 3% is really 0.03, so it's 1.03 raised to the X. And in this case, X would be the number of years. Hey, I just turned it into the uh, into the first kind. I just what I did in here is change one plus point oh three into one point oh three. Just did the sum, right? So that is B is just one plus R. If you're if you're switching from the version of things where you've got uh, you know suppose it tells you B is known, then you can figure out what R is. And if you know what R is, you can figure out what B is. These, that's a really easy conversion. Let's do, um, yeah, I don't want to do the, <laughs> what, we're going to need another tool to convert from this form to the E to the KX form. So we'll instead go from the E to the KX to, to this kind of form. So that's, that's a, a new problem. Here's a, I'll give you a decay problem. This is somewhat physically realistic, making up the numbers, but uh, radio spelling is an issue. That's, I'm trying to say radioactive. <laughs> a radioactive uh, sample decays according to a particular formula. Oh, these in science they almost always do this. That the k zero is the initial amount, and then we have e to the k times t. I'm using t for the variable just because this is this is a time sensitive thing. But you know, if you like, you could think about it as x, where uh, k is actually going to be negative. Okay. That's that's a, a a function that k there is something that depends on the particular substance involved. If it's like uh, strontium is one of the byproducts of nuclear reactions that you know needs to be gotten rid of when you when you have nuclear reactors. Um, and the k would be very different from that. But, you know, depending on what element is is you're looking at, it'll have a different decay rate, and that uh, basically is encapsulated by that number k. Um, so let's suppose we've got one gram of this of this stuff. And that's what we have when time is zero. 
what that tells me is that A0 is 1. Okay. So I've got 1 and e to a known number times t. I, you know, I'm feeling guilty about using t there. Let's just go back and say it's x. Okay. So our, our function, okay, x now, is going to be, no need to write 1 times, it's just going to be e to the negative 0.295 x. Can I, can, can I somehow think about that in the a times b to the x form? Well, it's actually in that form already. There's a 1 out front that we didn't even bother to write. And this actually looks like a base to the x power. The base is b to the negative 0.395. And we're raising that to the x power. It's the same trick I pulled a second ago about you have an exponential expression, and then you raise that to yet another power. You end up just multiplying in the exponents. Except I'm kind of using it in reverse. So what am, I, what am I after here? This number, e to the negative 0.395, that's our, the base for the exponential. I guess i got to turn on GeoGebra again to figure that out. It's not so hard. Um, except I've lost my pen. Oh, here it is. Okay. So actually, maybe I can just do it right into that one. I'll, I'll edit it. e to the minus 0.395. All right, so the B there is 0.673. Actually, I think I should round that the other way. It's 0.674. Okay, so that means that uh, uh, another way to write the same formula without the E's or anything would be this. It's 1 times 0.674 to the x. Now, I, I mentioned at, at the beginning that this was a decay question. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm writing on the other side, and I'm supposed to be... <laughs> I was writing on that side, and, and you couldn't see it in there. But, yeah, let me go through that again. I, I figured out what e to the negative 0.395 was on GeoGebra. It was 0.674, and that means our formula really can be re rewritten as 1 times 0.674 to the x. Um, notice that this number, the b, b in here, is smaller than 1. So you know that you're multiplying by something smaller than 1. That means you're getting smaller. As time goes forward, you get less and less of this stuff. If the number on the inside there is bigger than 1, you're going to be growing. And if it's 1, well, then you shouldn't even be using an exponential formula in that case. All right, that's that's it for today. Talk to you again soon.